Hi, I'm Xandra Brakefield. I'm professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and a geneticist at Massachusetts General Hospital. My laboratory and collaborators have been working on developing gene therapy for tuberous sclerosis for over 10 years. I'd like to tell you about those studies today and answer questions for you afterwards. I'd like to tell you about the work we've been doing on developing gene therapy for tuberous sclerosis. My laboratory has been working on this for probably over 10 years, and recently we've been joined by a company, BridgeBio, which is helping us to decide on what experiments need to be done to bring this to the FDA and evaluate safety for clinical trials. So gene therapy is basically genetic modification of cells in the body. And this can be done in a number of different ways by delivering DNA, RNA, or viruses, or GM stands here for genetically modified cells. Uh, they can put, be put directly into the brain. Uh, here shown also into the ventricles, which you'll hear about. This is a fluid space in the interior of the brain. And you can also administer them the virus sectors especially, via the blood circulation, and they can cross this blood-brain barrier and get into not only the brain cells, but also other cells throughout the body. So recently, over the past few years, there's been a lot of renewed excitement about the concept of gene therapy because there have been some successes for some diseases. I list here three different modes of gene therapy that are being used in the clinic but we're just going to concentrate on the first one, which is the one that we're using in our tuberous sclerosis models. So in this case, you use what's called an adeno-associated virus vector, which I'll explain to you in it very shortly. And it carries um, a copy, basically, of the gene that's missing in the disease. And it has been used successfully in a form of inherited childhood blindness to replace the missing gene there a defect in a blood cutting factor, and loss of a protein that's critical for motor neuron integrity, so to prevent motor neuron degeneration. So this is the vector that's being used in clinical trials. It's really a microscopic virus, which is kind of shown, the capsid is shown here. So 25 nanometers in diameter, very small. And there's no disease associated with the wild type virus. But actually, when you make vectors, you take out all the genes of the virus and just leave the sequences that are needed for packaging into the capsid. And then in that space that you gutted the virus, you put back in your therapeutic gene. And many studies have shown that you can get transgene expression for several years, or over 17 years in non-human primates. Episomal means that it doesn't integrate into the genome, so it doesn't cause mutations in the genome. They found excellent transgene expression in the brain, and they've shown that these vectors are safe and beneficial in many gene therapy trials. Over on the right here, you can just see the cross-section of a mouse brain where an AV vector encoding a fluorescent protein called GFP has been introduced, and you can see below how you can label uh, cells or deliver this gene to cells in the brain. So tuberous sclerosis is an example of a tumor suppressor syndrome. And there's two proteins involved, harmartin and tuberin. Harmartin is encoded in the TSC1 gene and tuberin in the TSC2 gene. So if unaffected people mean they don't have tuberous sclerosis, they inherit two copies of both of these genes. But individuals with either form of tuberous sclerosis have one mutated copy and then one normal copy of the genes. So if the gene, so here we are, this is shown actually for another tumor suppressor syndrome, retinoblastoma, but this would be what the patient inherits, a wild type and a mutant allele. And then if sometime Throughout life, in a tissue in the body that's susceptible, there's another uh, hit to the gene, to the, to the in this case, the wild-type gene, so it knocks out function of both genes, then that tissue will start overgrowing uh, and causing problems. And the timing of the tissue that this occurs in 
is what we call stochastic. That means it's, it, it happens kind of randomly. And that's why there are variations in symptoms and severity among patients. So this is the pathway that's involved. First, if you look on the left, this is the Gygus is the equivalent of uh, one of these tuberculosis genes. And you can see in the fly eye here that if the, this gene is non-functional, basically the cells enlarge. And you can see this also in the mouse brain where the TSC1 gene is disrupted. Both copies are disrupted in neurons and you can see how the brain enlarges. And this is because these two proteins, harmartin and tuberin, are part of a pathway in the cells that responds to growth factors and low energy levels. They act together, they always have to work together, and they inhibit a protein called REB, which in turn activates a protein called mTOR. And when mTOR is activated through various signaling pathways, it leads to increased protein synthesis, cell growth, and proliferation of cells. So when you're lacking either tuberin or hermartin in your cells, you no longer inhibit REB, and mTOR is just free to run at a fast pace. Now, as you know, there's a class of drugs derived from rap rapamycin that can inhibit mTOR, and those are used clinically to try to alleviate some of the symptoms of tuberous sclerosis. So I'm in a neurology department, and so we're especially interested in the neurologic features of tuberous sclerosis. And the brain, or here at central nervous system, is actually a hallmark of the disease, and it's seen in some disruption of the brain is seen in most affected individuals. And these include um, things like epilepsy, as well as developmental delay, and hydrocephalus is when the ventricles enlarge and actually that becomes a life-threatening syndrome, and I'll show you that in our animal model. So I've discussed some of these uh, things already. The what we call autosomal dominant nature of the disease, that means if you inherit one bad copy, you become susceptible to develop symptoms. The timing and the cell type of the second hit, which is kind of occurs randomly in different tissues. And it's a relatively common disease and it's, most of the symptoms are caused by these enlarged cell size and proliferation, which causes benign overgrowth in many tissues. That means it's, you do get kind of tumors, but they're benign, they're not malignant. And so if you can just reduce their size, that will relieve symptoms. The TSC1 uh, tends not to be as severe as TSC2 in patients. And our strategy is then to shrink these lesions or cell overgrowths by gene replacement of either um, harmartin or tuberin using these AAB vectors I've described and injecting them into the bloodstream in our mouse models. Now, there is an issue with the size of the, basically the, the DNA that encodes the proteins for these diseases. That for Harmartin is relatively small compared to that for Tuberin. And although the Harmartin copy of the gene or the copy of the message fits into an AV vector very neatly, Tuberin sequences are a little bit large, so we had to make uh, accommodations there. Now we have both a TSC1 and a TSC2 model. I'll just show the data for the TSC2 model here. The disease is created in mice which have been pre-programmed to have their TSC2 gene flanked by sequences that allow it to be eliminated or knocked out when you inject an enzyme called Cree recombinase. So we have an AV vector encoding this Cree recombinase, and we inject it into the brain ventricles of the mice when they're born. This leads to sequelae, which I'll, I'll show you in a, in a bit, which are reminiscent of what happens in the patients. Then 
later in the in the mouse's life, we inject an AV vector encoding a replacement gene. Now here I call it C tuberin because we had to shrink it a little bit to fit into this AV vector. And we inject it in the blood vessels behind the eye. This does not harm the eye at all. Uh, it's a benign injection. So we inject that and in our case the studies we've done so far we inject it at 21 days of age. If you look at survival analysis if you inject this Cree vector at birth and you do nothing else, the animals will die at about 50 days of age. But if at 21 days of age you inject this gene replacement vector into the circulation, you can see that it extends survival to a mean of 462 days. We can also show that if you have mice that you don't inject the Cree vector and you just inject the gene replacement vector, uh, they are fine. So there's no toxicity per se to the vector itself. Now this is just to show you how efficient we are at reaching cells in the brain through these roots. Just you don't need to concentrate on A and B because that's just the details of the, of the process, but we have mouse models with fluorescent proteins. So you could, this is just to show you in A that we inject this AB vector expressing this Cree recombinase into the brain ventricles at P0, we can get genes to a lot of cells in the brain, including those lining the ventricles, astrocytes, neurons, etc. And if we inject another AB vector at 21 days of age, expressing now another fluorescent protein again into the circulation so it has to cross the blood-brain barrier to get to the brain we're also able to label a lot of cells in the brain um, and deliver the gene back to them. So just to show you that we do hit a lot of cell, we knock out tuberin in a lot of cells in the brain initially and then we're able to replace it in a lot of cells in the brain by injection into the bloodstream at a later date. Now obviously those cells are not always going to be the same, so some subcells that lose tuberin may not get the replacement gene, and some cells that haven't lost it may get it, but on average um, we are able to give the gene back to most of the cells that have lost it. This just shows you some of the symptoms that we see. The mice do develop seizures. Uh, you can see this, this strobe tail here, hunched body position, and even foaming at the mouth. Interestingly, when the mice have these seizures, and we were testing them on a uh, wheel device where they, that they run on, after these seizures, seizures they performed normally on the uh, rotator device. So, but they do, that is a, definitely a symptom that is associated with tuberous sclerosis. This shows you a cross-section of the mouse brain and what we see when we, when we stain it is we, if we look at the ventricles, this would be a normal mouse brain and this, these cells you see here are what's called the choroid plexus, they're, they're normal. But if we look at a mouse that we've injected with this Cree recombinase vector, we start seeing proliferation of cells around the ventricles and even the formation of nodules that can clog the flow of the cerebral spinal fluid in the ventricles. If we however take these mice and we give them back the our version of the tuberin gene, uh, the lining of the ventricles normalizes. These are MR images of, in this case, TSC1 mice where we've knocked out that gene at P0 and this is looking at 30 days of age in living mice this would be the cross-section of a normal mouse and the others are cross-sections of mice which were injected with this Cree recombinase vector. And you can see the enlargement of the ventricles and even the formation of these nodules along the ventricles that seem to block the blood flow. So we actually think in many of our mouse models when they die at 50 days of age it's due to uh, hydrocephalus probably rather than seizures. So why are we doing this? 
Although there are rapamycin analogs and they can be effective for many of the symptoms, in addition to being expensive, and gene therapy will be expensive too, they require continuous treatment and there is reduced access across the into the brain um, after injection into the bloodstream. There's also some studies that that suggests that mTOR, which is the, remember that's the pathway that's affected, is very important for neuronal development. Um, and so these drugs might potentially interfere with development of the brain um, in, in patients. Although there are pe people, different camps on this, and some people think it will, and some people think it won't. But they are, and they also do compromise immune functions in the individual. So as I mentioned before, AV vectors have shown success in clinical trials with sometimes benefit from just a single injection. They are able to pass from the circulation into the brain and not only can they deliver to the brain but also to other tissues and as you know tuberous sclerosis can involve other tissues for, in for instance kidney and lung. In the case of tuberous sclerosis, we know what the target is. We know we need to replace harmartin and tuberin in cells that lack them. And we think that there sh this should have reduced toxicity because either one of these proteins can only act in combination with the other protein. So if someone has lost, for instance, harmartin, they'll still have normal levels of tuberin. And if you give back even an excess of harmartin, only that which interacts with tuberin should be effective. So we think that that probably is a safety gauge of preventing toxicity by overexpression of the protein. We think that you should see uh, short-term effects after the gene therapy because the lesions should shrink as they saw with renal lesions in um, when they treated with rapamycin. And there's a possibility that providing an extra copy of the gene to cells in the body that will protect them from loss of the wild type allele in at a future time. We think that this, children may benefit from this. It's less invasive treatment for hydrocephalus than surgery or we think than tre treating with rapamycin. And treating it early may present a uh, secondary compromise of brain functions. And Assuming that it's not toxic, if there is a second hit or loss of function in the tissue later in life, you still have the option of using rapamycin analogs to treat. So this is the team that's been working together for quite a long time. I said over 10 years, very dedicated to developing the models and treating the patients. And I didn't mention Elizabeth Teal here. She is our clinical advisor. And I thank you for your attention, and I hope that you will be feel free to ask me any questions uh, about our work. Thank you.